welcome to the wonders of physics. Although my clothes and surroundings make it look like you're about to see an old horror movie, such is not the case. I hope to entertain you, to amuse you, to educate you, but not to scare you. So prepare yourself for a venture into a world of unusual phenomena. Many of the things which you will see will look like magic, but there will be no tricks. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the wonders of physics. Welcome to the Wonders of Physics. It's very nice to see you here. Although I look like I'm dressed as a magician, in fact, you're not going to see magic today. A magician might take a magic wand like this and wave it over something and cause it to burst into flames. I'm not going to do things like that. That's too easy. Rather, I'm going to show you science. How many of you ride a bicycle? Oh, just about everyone. That's good. Have you ever seen a bicycle wheel you can hold in your hand and spin around? A few people have, maybe in the museum across here, right? Well, we have such a thing. Now, if I take this bicycle wheel, I can make a pendulum out of it, just like we did with the bowling ball. I can hang this bicycle wheel on this wire, and it just moves back and forth. Not very interesting, just uh, like an ordinary uh, uh, pendulum, like the bowling ball. But if we cause this to spin, and for this I'll ask my assistant, Mr. Lovell, to help here, we can put the starter rope around uh, the bicycle wheel. This is a rope. How many of you have a lawnmower that you start up with a rope? Uh, a lot of you. OK. It's the very thing we're going to do here. We have this rope attached to the bicycle wheel so we can get it spinning nice and fast. And something very interesting is going to happen. So watch very closely once we get this spinning. Not so good. Why don't you just spin it with your hand? OK, I think that's not spinning as fast as it might have, but it's spinning fast enough to demonstrate what I wanted to show you. The bicycle wheel is not falling. And in fact, that's one reason when you ride your bicycle, you don't fall off. As long as the wheel keeps spinning, it remains vertical, up and down. And it doesn't fall over. So if you'll help me again here, Tom. Thank you. Well. <clears throat> There are many examples we could show you of the physics of motion. And that's just a few examples of how things move. But we want to cover a lot of things today. So I would like to move on and talk about the physics of heat, uh, things that are hot and cold. And in order to demonstrate this, we first have to make a flame. And in order to make a flame here, we will turn on what's called a Bunsen burner here and light it with a match. It's a little like the uh, burner on your stove, perhaps, if you have a gas stove at home. So I'll turn on the gas and light the Bunsen burner. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick that you could, if you want, do at home. But you have to be very careful whenever you're playing with fire, because this is potentially dangerous. Um, take a little pop can, like this orange crush can, and put a little water in it. Here's some water. It's like you'd get out of your faucet. And we'll put just a little bit of water in it about so much. And we'll just put that over the flame. So you could put that on your stove at home. And we'll just let that cook for a minute while we do something else, and then we'll come back to it in a few minutes. Now, um, in addition to things that are hot, we're making something hot over here, there are many things that are cold. And I'd like to show you something that's um, really quite cold. Um, I have something in here that is called liquid nitrogen. Now, liquid nitrogen is a very cold substance. Um, it's at a temperature of about 321 degrees below zero. That's Fahrenheit, or about 196 degrees below zero Celsius. And um, it's a liquid, but it's a funny kind of a liquid. If I pour it out here, it looks just like water or any other liquid, except it doesn't make things wet. 
And the reason is because it boils at a very low temperature. And so it boils and becomes a gas. Uh, and it evaporates. And you don't see anything left of it. Now, one interesting thing we can do with liquid nitrogen that's very popular. I have here a big steel cylinder, um, inside of which is a smaller cylinder. And I can fill this cylinder with this liquid nitrogen. So I'll just put it down in there, and you see it boiling away. And it's boiling because um, the cylinder that I stuck down in there is quite warm. And so it warms up the liquid nitrogen, and it boils. And so now the cylinder has cooled down. And it's full of this liquid nitrogen. I have a little cylinder full of liquid nitrogen. And I'm going to lower that down into this big cylinder, like so. I'm going to take this cork, and I'm going to hammer it on. And then I'm going to take the whole thing, and I'm going to shake it. And this is obviously not something you should try at home. When the liquid nitrogen began to boil, it began to exert a very large pressure. And finally, the pressure was sufficient to blow the cork off. And it went all the way back to the back of the room, hit the back wall. I don't know where it is now, but with a tremendous explosion. And so many of the things you're going to see today are potentially very dangerous. So be very careful. You should not go home and try to do some of these things. I'll tell you which ones you can do and which ones you should not do. So that's liquid nitrogen, a very cold substance. Now, while we're talking about things that are cold and things that boil, let me ask you a question. At what temperature does water boil? Who knows? The temperature that water boils at. Uh, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius um, at atmospheric pressure, at sea level. But if you go up on top of a mountain, in fact, water boils at a temperature lower than 100 degrees Celsius. Well, he's correct that water in this room would boil at 100 degrees Celsius. But in fact, we can cause water to boil at a much lower temperature. And I can do that in this apparatus behind me here. Here we have an apparatus that contains some water in this little flask. And we can evacuate that flask. We can pump the air out from above it. And that's like lowering the pressure. It's like if you were to go up on a mountain. You would see um, um, the atmospheric pressure would be reduced, and the water would boil at a lower temperature than it might otherwise. So in order to do that, I'm going to turn on this vacuum pump. And you'll see this gauge go down, indicating that the pressure is dropping. And as it does, I want you to watch very carefully what happens here. Now watch here. You will see as the pressure drops, you will see the water begin to boil. And in fact, it's not hot at all. I can touch it. It's at the same temperature as the room. So in fact, water will boil at almost any temperature you wish, depending on the pressure of the air that's above it. Now keep watching, because something even stranger is going to happen to this water. If you watch for a moment, the water is boiling away, and it's not hot. Um, in fact, if anything, it feels a little bit cold. So just watch for a moment, and we'll see if something happens to the water. Can you see what's happened? Can you see what's in there? In fact, ice has formed. There's ice inside of there. So not only did the water boil, but it also froze. Now why can it boil and freeze all at the same time? Well, the reason is that as it boils, it gives off heat. In fact, when you perspire, that's what happens. The water evaporates from your skin, and it takes heat away from you, and it cools you off. That's why you feel cold after you go in swimming, and then you come out and stand around, and the water evaporates from you. You cool off. And that's exactly what happened here. The water cooled off, and in fact, it cooled off so much that it turned into ice. So right here, without any heater, without any refrigerator, I've boiled water for you, and I've turned it into ice. And in fact, it now feels quite cold, just as you would expect for ice. So I'll turn this off, and I'll let the pressure back in. You'll see this go back up, indicating that the pressure, the air, is now entering again. And this is filling up. And after a little while, it will warm up and become 
ordinary water again. Now over here I have the can boiling away. By the, by the way, how do you know that the water in here is boiling? It's, the water vapor is coming out of the can and then it's coming in contact with the cool air and it's condensing just like in a cloud. And that's actually condensed water that you're seeing. So if at home you uh, take a pop can like that, fill it with water, and let it boil for a while, you can then take it, and if you have some tongs, something like this, maybe you don't have anything quite like that, but something you could pick up a hot can with, don't try this with your fingers, you'll burn them, you can take that can and turn it upside down in perhaps a sink filled with water, which I have here, this has a little water in it, and watch what happens. It crushed the can. And now you can see, in fact, why I used an orange crush can, because we're going to crush it. I'll pass this around. There you go. So that's one you can do at home if you're very careful, uh, so as not to burn yourself. Now, uh, the next thing I want to show you, I'll try to light it from the Bunsen burner here. And I'm going to light these uh, five candles over here in honor of Sally's birthday. So there's one candle, two, oops, two, three, five candles. Okay. Then I'm going to take something out from down here. If I can get it. What do you think's in here? Watch. What was in there? Does someone know? Do you know? Water? No, not water. What was in here is a gas called carbon dioxide. And you can't burn things in carbon dioxide. Now, you may ask, how did I get carbon dioxide sitting in here? Well, carbon dioxide is a heavy gas. So it not nicely set in there. And I could walk around, and it's an invisible gas, so you couldn't see it. But this was filled with this gas, carbon dioxide. Now, the way I put carbon dioxide in here was with something that we call dry ice. And I'll show you the piece of dry ice that I had in there. Right here is a piece of dry ice. Now, does anyone know why they call it dry? It turns directly from a solid into a gas. And that's why we call it dry ice, because you never get wet from it. You can touch it, and it doesn't melt. It evaporates. It turns into a gas. So that's dry ice. And dry ice is like ordinary ice, except it's very much colder. Dry ice is at a temperature of about 69 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Not quite as cold as the liquid nitrogen, but very cold indeed. And if you touch it, it can uh, uh, freeze your fingers. Or it's about 56 degrees below zero Celsius. So dry ice is very um, interesting stuff that you can do a lot of different things with. And in fact, I have some dry ice here. I have a whole container filled with dry ice. And one thing I can do with this, we have this little uh, uh, container of water. I'm just going to dump all this dry ice into the water, and we'll see what it does. Now what's happening? The dry ice is, in fact, evaporating, turning into a gas. Um, the gas is quite cold, so it comes up and makes contact with the air, and then it condenses the moisture out of the air. And in fact, it forms a cloud. So if you ever have any dry ice, this is a nice way for you to make a cloud, a cloud of dry ice. Now, um, another thing we can do that demonstrates a property of heat is to, let me light the candle again. How many of you have ever blown bubbles before? Oh, almost everyone. Good. Well, you may have seen there's some little solution you can buy at the toy store, bubble solution. 
Um, maybe you have a little pipe that you can put in your mouth and blow bubbles with, and it makes bubbles and they, they go off. Well, we're going to do something very much like that, except I'm going to do it in a rather unusual way. Instead of using the pipe to blow the bubbles, I have a little pipe mounted here, and it's connected to something here so that I can blow through this tube with um, some compressed gas, which I have back here. And so for this, I'm going to turn off a couple of the lights, and I'm going to blow some bubbles, not with my mouth, but with this uh, special compressed gas that we have back here. And I want you to watch very carefully because something very interesting is going to happen to these particular bubbles. Watch once more. Now, you've probably never seen a bubble do that. And the reason is these are not ordinary bubbles. These are bubbles filled with not air, but with natural gas, the same kind of gas you have perhaps in your home that uh, operates your oven, perhaps. And that's also the reason that when the bubbles form, they rise. Ordinarily, if you filled a bubble with air, it wouldn't rise. It would just float around and perhaps fall to the ground. But these bubbles rise because natural gas is lighter than air. And they will also burn because, of course, natural gas uh, does burn. So we'll do one more. Oh, guess not. So that's bubbles. <laughs> you've probably been to a zoo or a circus or something, and you've seen a bottle of helium. This is a bottle of helium. And I'm going to blow up a balloon with this helium, just like perhaps uh, you've seen someone do at the zoo or at the circus. And ordinarily, you would see someone blow up a balloon, and they would tie it off and tie a string around it and give it to you. And you would walk around with it, and everyone would look and say, gee, that's really nice. Well, I'm not going to do that. That's a little too ordinary. I'm going to do something else with this balloon that perhaps you've seen and perhaps you've not. I'm going to actually take this helium and breathe it. Now, I caution you, don't go home and try breathing things, because most things that you breathe are very harmful. They can hurt you quite a lot. So don't try breathing things. But helium is one thing you can breathe. And I will breathe it. And after I breathe it, I want you to watch very carefully. And I want you to listen very carefully. So you'll have to be very quiet and listen to what it sounds like when I breathe the helium. And as you see, it does very little to me, except it makes me sound like Donald Duck. <laughs> and the reason for that is that sound travels faster in helium than it does in air. Now, I'm not pretending. It's really doing this to my voice. It's really making me sound like a duck. But as time goes on, the helium will leave my lungs and will be replaced by air, and little by little, I'll begin to sound normal again. <laughs> this is what we call our artificial geyser. How many of you have been to Yellowstone Park? Fair number of you. There are places out in, in the West, like in Yellowstone Park, where they have these geysers, uh, big natural geysers, where the um, water is down in crevices down in the earth or heated, and then ever so often it erupts and throws water up many hundreds of feet, like the Old Faithful geyser is a very famous one. So about once an hour it goes off and shoots water up a hundred feet or so. So this is our artificial geyser. And if you just watch that, it will go off uh, about every 10 minutes until I turn it off in a little while. So it'll probably go off once or perhaps twice more. So just watch the geyser out of the corner of your eye. Meanwhile, back to the sulfur hexafluoride, I was going to fill this balloon with this other gas, which is not like helium, but in fact is quite different, something called sulfur hexafluoride. And again, this is one of those few gases that you can safely breathe. Most other gases you cannot do this with. But sulfur hexafluoride, you can indeed breathe, and you will see it will have a very interesting 
effect. So watch and listen. And as you see, it also has very little effect on me, except it makes my voice sound rather low. <laughs> now, the reason for this is that sulfur hexafluoride is a very heavy gas, and so sound travels very slowly in a gas like sulfur hexafluoride. The other interesting thing about sulfur hexafluoride is that because it's a very heavy gas, it stays down in my lungs for a long, long time. And so you may have to listen to me sound like this for the rest of the day. But perhaps not. As time goes on, little by little, the sulfur hexafluoride in my lungs will be replaced with ordinary air, and little by little, I'll sound more and more normal. So that's sulfur hexafluoride. And that's one of the few other gases that it's safe to breathe. Here's a balloon that, in fact, is filled with air, ordinary air. Nothing very interesting about this balloon, except I'm going to do something with this balloon. I'm going to take a rather sharp needle, and I'm going to touch it to this balloon. Now, some of you are holding your ears. Why are you doing that? You think it's going to pop. Now, are you sure? Well, let's watch, because I'm going to take this very, very sharp needle, and I'm going to touch it to the balloon here. Oops. And I'm going to see if I can stick it into the balloon. You notice the hiccup at the end? It always does that. Now I'm going to stick it through the other side of the balloon. Look at that. Now, you've probably seen magicians do that before. How many of you have seen a magician stick a thing through a balloon? Do you know how they do it? Do you know? Tell me. Very good. The magicians are going to hate me because you're not supposed to tell a magician's trick. But since this isn't a magic show, this is a science show, I'm going to tell you how it's done. And then you can go home and do this yourself. And you're right. What's your name? Josh. Josh? Josh knew exactly how to do this trick. And you will, too, in a moment. All you do is take the balloon and put a little piece of transparent scotch tape on each side. Because when a balloon bursts, the reason it does that is you make a puncture hole and then it tears. And the scotch tape keeps it from tearing. So you can make a hole right through it and the balloon doesn't burst. To be sure, a little air comes out and after a little while it will deflate. You may notice it's getting a little smaller already. And perhaps you can hear a little bit of hiss as the air comes out. But you can amuse your friends by sticking a needle through a balloon. So I'll try that at home. So uh, that's some interesting tricks that you can do with balloons. Now the next thing, since uh, we're doing things that uh, involve sound, uh, talking with uh, helium and sulfur hexafluoride, uh, why don't we move on and discuss the subject of sound. Sound is a branch of physics, just like Motion, or mechanics, is a branch of physics, and just like heat is a branch of physics. Sound is also a branch of physics. Now, there are many interesting things we can do with sound, and the first thing I'm going to do is turn on something here that we call an oscilloscope. See, maybe it's on already. Um, and on this oscilloscope, you will see what we call the electrical waveform of my voice. So you can see it going up and down. And uh, if you just watch that, I can show you the electrical waveforms of various sounds. Now I have in front of me here some things called tuning forks. Now a tuning fork is something you hit with a little mallet, and it makes a particular sound. And I want you to watch here and see what that sound looks like on the oscilloscope. Now let's watch the other and see if you can see the difference. First this one. Now the other. Let me do them uh, one by one and tell me what the difference is. But be very quiet. Who knows the difference? You. Um, yes, this one 
had more wiggles, more up and downs than this one did. And that's what makes one frequency or one pitch sound low and one pitch sound high. So this is a low pitch and this is a high pitch. And the difference is the number of wiggles that go up and down um, in the electrical waveform. So the oscilloscope can be used to look at many sounds and to sort of get a picture of what the sound looks like. Now I want to turn off the geyser because we're going to move on to discuss the subject of electricity. And you've probably all heard that when you're working with electricity, you should not have electricity and water around together. It's a, um, a difficult combination and potentially dangerous. So we're going to do some things that involve electricity. And for the first thing I do, I will need a volunteer. Lots of volunteers today. Let's see. How about, how about you? What is your name? Toby. Toby? What I want you to do, Toby, is turn around and give me your hand and step right up there and stand right in the center. And I want you to put this hand, oh, careful. <laughs> Most dangerous part is standing here. I want you to put this hand right up there. Now, Toby, are you good at following instructions? Well, you're in big trouble. <laughs> because this is perfectly safe, provided you do exactly what I say, okay? So, all you have to do, Toby, is just leave your hand right there while I turn on this switch over here, and we'll watch and see what happens to Toby. Now, Toby, shake your head a little bit. Toby? <laughs> Shake your head. Now don't move yet, Toby. I'm gonna discharge you. Step down. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> Toby, don't you ever comb your hair? <laughs> now, what we did here was connected Toby to something that we call a Van de Graaff generator. A Van de Graaff generator makes very high voltages. About 100,000 volts was connected to Toby. Did you feel anything, Toby? A little bit? You felt it tingle a little bit. The reason that we could connect Toby to 100,000 volts without hurting him was that we had him stand on this plastic stool. And so although Toby was connected to 100,000 volts, there was no way for the electric current to go through his body because uh, it could not pass through this insulated stool. Now, you've probably all had that experience of uh, combing your hair on a dry day and having your hair stand up. What do you call that? Static electricity. That's exactly right. So this is just a machine that makes static electricity. Now, the next thing I would like to show you with electricity I'm going to need a volunteer again, except for this one, I would like you not to volunteer yourself, but who is your favorite teacher that you would like to have come down here? You? You? Have a favorite teacher? You? Come down here. <laughs> and you are Mrs. Tofty. Mrs. Tofty, turn around here and look at the audience. Mrs. Tofty is going to help us with this next demonstration. Now, I hope uh, you don't mind being uh, around electricity. It doesn't bother you, does it? Okay, good. And Mrs. Tofty, what I'd like you to do is follow me over here. And we'd like to put you inside of this cage. <laughs> Just sit in there and make yourself comfortable. And let me do one other thing. Let me hand you something to hold here so you, you don't feel too useless in there. Now, I'll just be careful not to break it, otherwise it's perfectly safe. So you hold that, and let's see. I guess I'll have to give this to you. You might want to turn it upside down. And we're going to lock the door, and we have Mrs. Tofty, where many of you have probably always wanted to get Mrs. Tofty. <laughs> where she's perfectly safe. 
Now what I'm going to do is turn off the lights. I think what I'll do is turn off some of the lights, but not quite all of them. We'll see how this works with this many lights on. And we will turn on a gadget over to her right and see what happens. Thank you, you're a very good sport. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Mrs. Tofty was very brave to do that. But in fact, one thing I hope you noticed when she was in there was that she was holding a tube, a long glass tube, uh, that wasn't doing anything. But yet, down here in the front, we had another tube, similar tube, which in fact was lighting up. I hope you noticed that. And so she was actually safer, even though she was near this very high voltage, than was our other volunteer down here in the front row because she was inside of this cage. And there's a moral to this. If you're ever caught in a lightning storm, a good place to be is inside of some enclosure, some metal enclosure. That's really the safest place to be. In fact, inside of your automobile is a pretty safe place because it's all surrounded by metal. And so uh, the voltage, the high voltage cannot uh, get at you and do you harm as long as you are enclosed by some sort of metal uh, cage or container. So if you can find a chicken coop or something to get into, uh, that would be a very safe place to be if you're in a lightning storm. Don't stand under a tree. So I'm going to go way over here, and I'm going to turn this thing on. Are you watching? How many of you have seen one of these before? Quite a few. Where have you seen such a thing? Where have you seen one? In the red. At, at where? At school you have one. OK, well, maybe your school does have one. But the place you often see these is in science fiction movies, old Frankenstein movies, right? They always have these things, and they're called Jacob's Ladders. And they're really not good for much except they're good props in a science fiction movie. So that's where you often see these. They're called Jacob's Ladders. Now, there are a couple of other um, demonstrations of electricity. Over here, we have another Tesla coil, a somewhat smaller one, um, but otherwise quite similar to the big Tesla coil that we had there. And I'll just turn it on. And off of the top here will come sparks, very much like the sparks that came off the top of that, but they'll not be nearly so long. So I'll just turn it on and perhaps uh, kill a few lights so that you can see that a little bit better. So you see sparks are coming off the top, just a few inches long. Now you say, well, that's not very impressive. Um, I've seen sparks that long before, but there is something that we can do with this little Tesla coil. We could also do it with the big Tesla coil, but for this next thing, I'll use the little one. What do you think is in this balloon? Helium. helium. You think it's helium, why? Because it floats, because it's lighter than air. So what I'm gonna do is take this balloon, and I'm gonna hook it onto this tube that we've used before for demonstrating the Tesla coil. And I'm going to turn this on. And perhaps uh, turn off a couple of lights again. And I'm going to bring this over next to the Tesla coil. We'll see what happens when we bring this one close to the spark. Now, for those of you who thought that balloon, for those of you who thought that balloon had helium in it, would you like to change your minds? No? In fact, it had in it hydrogen. And hydrogen is a very explosive gas, unlike helium. Helium will not burn, but hydrogen burns in a very explosive manner. 
So that balloon was filled not with helium, but with hydrogen. So just because it was lighter than air does not mean that it's helium. Uh, it could also be hydrogen. And in fact, in that case, it was. Now, uh, that concludes the things that I wanted to say about electricity. I would like now to go on and talk about magnetism. Now, magnetism is closely related to electricity, as I'll describe in a few moments. Let me turn the oscilloscope off here. Many of you have probably seen magnets of various sorts. These are horseshoe magnets. They stick together one way, and the other way they repel. They don't stick. Um, so these are magnets like you might buy at the toy store, horseshoe magnets. Now, if you want to make a strong magnetic field, this is not the way you make a magnetic field. You make a magnetic field by use of electric currents. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Here I have a coil of wire. It goes around many, many times, and I'll pass an electric current through it. Um, after I plug it in. And I'm going to take a little aluminum ring and put this ring over the top here. And I'll press the button and cause the current to flow. And then I'll release the button. And you watch very carefully what happens. Want to see it again? Now watch carefully. It goes fast. It jumps up. And that's because this is creating a very intense magnetic field, uh, which is exerting a force on this ring. And the ring, by the way, is not at all attracted to the magnet. It's because it's an alternating electric current. And thus, it produces a force on things which are not otherwise magnetic. So uh, if I wanted to make that a little more spectacular, I could add something, a big chunk of iron. Now, the iron has the effect of concentrating the magnetic field and making it go up much higher. So I can just set that piece of iron on there and put the aluminum ring back on there and do it again. And watch very carefully what happens. Quite a bit higher. Watch again. Now, is that pretty impressive? You like that? <laughs> would you like to see it go even higher? You would? Well, there is a way to do that. I'm going to take this empty uh, dish here put the aluminum ring in it, and I'm going to fill the dish with this liquid nitrogen that we've used before. And let it boil away. And when you cool something down, it turns out it becomes a better conductor of electricity. And when something becomes a good electrical conductor, then magnetic fields can exert a bigger force on it. And so as this cools down, it's becoming a better and better conductor of electricity. So you see, electricity and magnetism are very closely related. Um, and so after it's cooled down, I'll do the same thing that we did before with the iron on the top. And we will see how high we can make this ring of aluminum go after we've cooled it down to this very, very low temperature of liquid nitrogen. And the way we know it has cooled down is that once it has completely come to the same temperature as the liquid nitrogen, the boiling will stop. So the boiling has almost stopped now. And so the ring has cooled down to this very low temperature of minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very cold. And so in order to pick the ring up, I have to use tongs. If I stuck my fingers in there, it would be very dangerous. Um, so I can pick this aluminum ring up and put it on here. and energize the magnet again. Now, there are many other things we can do with magnetic fields. I have back here another sort of coil. It goes around and around. And it's connected to something that's like a big battery. It's something that we call a capacitor. And I can take one of these orange crush cans, like I used before, and I can put it down in there. And I can charge up this capacitor, just like you would charge up the battery in your car. And as I charge it up, you can watch on this meter right here. And you will see the meter go up. Now, when the meter is all the way up to the top here, that will be 10,000 volts of electricity 
charged in this capacitor back here. So I'm beginning to charge it up, and it's about 4,000 volts now. And I'm going to charge it up to about 8,000 volts, and then I'm going to discharge it. And I warn you, it makes a little bit of noise, so don't let it scare you. I'll warn you when it's about to happen. Right about now, look what it did to the can. And you can see, again, you can see again why we used an orange crush can in order to crush it. So that was the intense magnetic field pushing on it and crushing it. And again, this is an aluminum can, so it's not at all attracted to a magnet. I'll pass that around. Now, would you like to see it again? You would? OK, except this time I'm going to do something slightly different. You look like an old baseball player. <laughs> OK? This time, instead of crushing the can by putting it down in the coil, we're going to set it up on top of the coil, like this. And we're going to charge the capacitor up. And we will see if we can make a perfect catch. So watch the meter. We're coming up. That's 5,000 volts. That's 6,000 volts. 7,000. When we get up to 8,000 volts, are you ready? Very good. You can keep the can as a souvenir, but I want my glove back at the end of the lecture. So you can see magnetic forces can be very, very large. In this apparatus, we make a magnetic field with two coils painted red here. And this magnetic field is going to be so strong that we can actually suspend something that's quite heavy, like a softball, but made out of aluminum in this magnetic field. And watch what happens. Now, this is not magic. Uh, it is the force of a magnetic field exerted on an electrical conductor. Perhaps more spectacular is to do it with a little aluminum cylinder. It's magnetically levitated or suspended. Uh, and it looks like it defies gravity, but it's just the force of a magnet um, exerted on that aluminum cylinder, which is holding it in that position. So magnets can be very, very strong. They can hold things which are quite heavy. So uh, that uh, concludes what I want to say about um, mag magnetism. And I would like to move on now to the last subject of today. And that is the subject of light. Light is another example of physics. Um, and there are many interesting things that we can do with light. Uh, have you ever seen light go around a bend? Well, that's a little unusual. Maybe some people have and maybe some haven't. But I'm going to show you light going around a bend. And in order to do that, I'm going to use this apparatus over here, which in fact is filled with water up to about this point. Inside of here is water. And you notice that the laser is actually shining through here. It goes through a window on this side and out a window on this side. OK? And if I pull the plug here, I can make water come out, and it's going to be caught in a trough up here, so it won't get the floor wet. And then I will run around and turn out the lights. And I want you to look at the laser beam traveling in a curved path. Uh, the, the next couple of things I want to show you that involve light, I will need um, a volunteer for. Now, let's see. Uh, who hasn't helped me? How about, uh, how about you? <laughs> now, come down here and turn around and face the audience. What is your name? Maurice. Maurice? Okay, Maurice is going to help us 
with something that may look a little bit like magic to you, but unlike the magicians, we're going to explain to you what we do after we do it. Now, Maurice, if you'd go over there to my assistant, Mr. Level, and uh, we're going to take this cloth off the table here, and I'm just going to sort of hold this cloth up while they get ready. And we're going to show you something that looks very much like magic. Um, how many of you have been to a magic show? Oh, almost everyone. Well, you may have seen this done before in a magic show. But what you will see here that you will not see in a magic show is that it will be explained how we do it. In a magic show, you know, they never explain to you how they do these things. How are we doing back there? Almost got him. Do we have him disassembled? Very nearly. A couple of screws are sticking. Okay. Okay, how are we doing? Just fine. Okay, we have him all disconnected, huh? I think we'd better get him out of there while he's ahead. <laughs> Let me first explain how we're doing this. Uh, this is not magic. In fact, there's a mirror right here. And he is behind that mirror, as you'll see when we extract him. Many magical illusions are done this way, with mirrors, appropriately placed so you don't notice them. Thank you, Maurice. <laughs> so you see, with mirrors, one can do many illusions. And you've probably seen the magicians do these sorts of things many times, and this is one of the tricks that they use. But here, we show you how we do them. Now, there's one more illusion uh, where I will need a volunteer. Let's see. How about the cute little girl right here? Now, turn around and face the audience. What is your name? Jennifer. OK. Now, Jennifer is going to help us with this next magical illusion. Jennifer, would you go right over there to my assistant, Mr. Lovell? And he will take you behind the curtain for a moment. OK. So we'll turn off the lights here again. And we will show you our final illusion. You feel OK, Jennifer? OK, now, Jennifer, would you like to disappear? Hold still. We're going to bring Jennifer back. <laughs> Again, an illusion. Thank you, Jennifer. Very much like you would see in a magic show, this time done with a plate of glass. Jennifer was back here, reflected off the plate of glass with the light shining on her. The skeleton that you saw was behind the glass with, a, plate, with the, uh, a light shining on it. So many of the illusions that you see at magic shows are done with mirrors and plates of glass. There are many interesting things that one can do. And so when you go to a magic show, this is not to detract from the wonder of what you see, but perhaps to give you a greater appreciation of how much physics is involved, even in something like magic. So that brings us to the conclusion of our show. And I would like to finish with one last demonstration. You've seen many examples in which we've made, made things uh, uh, explode, uh, geysers which uh, go off, uh, s uh, lightning, thunder, uh, and so forth. And this reminds you of the weather. I would like to do one last demonstration that involves weather. I would like to make for you a cloud. 
and this cloud will be the conclusion. And so, I drag an apparatus out here. That is our artificial cloud. So I'll put it right in the middle. We'll close the curtain. I'll put on my hat to make a proper exit. And in appreciation for your attentiveness and interest in the wonders of physics, I'll make for you a cloud. <laughs>